Welcome to Talk About here on Shaw TV. Thanks for tuning in. My name is John Twig, and we've got another <coughs> good guest for you. It's Ken Blackburn of the Arts Council and the Museum. Ken, thanks for coming in. It's a pleasure, John. Good now, to see you again. <laughs> uh, you've got two full-time jobs. Yeah, I guess <laughs> that's the new economy, right? <laughs> two jobs to make one income. Well, I think we could do a full show on both of them, but uh, we're going to squeeze them in. Uh, you first came to town, I think, around 2000, 2000 uh, Actually, a little later than that. I arrived in a blizzard in uh, December of 2004, ah. yeah, out to Black Creek. That was my destination, and uh, right by Saratoga Beach. And I, I'll never forget the trip because I had left Ontario in a blizzard, and it followed me the entire <laughs> way here in my car. So yeah. it was about six, seven days of solid snow. So. What drew you to BC? Love. Maybe that's appropriate to say oh. for Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Back then, yeah, my, uh, my partner had been uh, doing her master's at Concordia, uh. and she was from Kamloops. Uh, BC girls are always coming home yeah. <laughs> if you meet them out <laughs> east. They're always returning to BC. So uh, she finished her master's. We were living together in Montreal. Her family had moved to the island. And I had never been to Vancouver Island, and I yeah. thought, okay, I'll come and look and see. And uh, that was it. I, uh, I, I never went back. Well, you seem to have found a real niche here. Right? You, are you happy here? I, absolutely, yeah. And, and I think you're right. Uh, Vancouver Island is a very mystical place. It's, a, it's a, got a tremendous energy to it. Uh, and I think for that part of my life, looking for a way to apply a lot of uh, travel experiences that I'd had, as well as my arts background, they fused really well here. And yeah. uh, this place is very conducive to, I think, creative and inspiration, inspirational yeah. thinking. So yes, yeah. uh, I did find the right place. Which came first, the museum or the Arts Council? The museum did. And yeah. the museum uh, ran an ad in the paper for a public programmer. And I had never been to Campbell River, uh, uh, living out at Saratoga Beach. I had spent, and I had been there a couple of months, I'd spent most of my time going down to Courtney yeah. and had never come north. Uh, and then when I saw the ad in the paper, I thought, oh, a museum in Campbell River. You know. And I expected a, uh, a very small, you know, somewhat rural yeah. museum, which is not the yeah. case. Uh, yeah. I was absolutely blown away when I saw the yeah. place. And, uh, I think the Campbell River Museum is rated as one of the best museums in North America for the size of the community. That's true. That's yeah. right. And, and it's well deserved. Uh, yeah. It's a credit to this community that they yeah. built yeah. a museum of that caliber here. And, uh, yeah. and to the current staff, you know, the work that they do, uh, amazing. Yeah. Now, I, 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 uh, there's lots of stuff I want to talk about with the uh, Arts Council, but, you know, uh, the museum had an event Friday night, the Clam Garden thing, and I went just, well, because it's a topic that I'm interested in, mm -hmm. but uh, also just to see the crowd. You had about uh, 100 people out. Pretty close, yeah. yeah. And then um, on Saturday afternoon, you had Andrew Nikiforek, the new writer-in-residence, which is affiliated with the museum mm -hmm. through the Hague Brown Institute. Uh, and he had about 80 people out. Yeah. Now, is that kind of standard for, you know, your events? And you do quite a few events there. We're getting that to be the standard. I, traditionally, no. Our talks uh, would be about half that, depending yeah. on the topic. Unless we do something that has very strong regional interest, like uh, logging, for example, or fishing, we'll, we yeah. will get good crowds. Uh, or good attendance for that. But we, you know, our programming tries to cover a broad spectrum of areas, so many of the talks are, are not that well attended. Yeah. But I have to say, over the last year, two years, I'm finding, uh, maybe it's the topics we're picking, but I, I think there's a lot of new people coming to town, and I think they're coming uh, from more urban areas, uh, perhaps retiring yeah. here. Or, yeah. um, so I think their expectations for culture are, are somewhat yeah you know, more sophisticated maybe, or, or they're rising. Yeah. So I think if we are putting on good quality uh, talks, for example, or our historic tours were completely sold out last year, I yeah. think people are engaging with them yeah. now. So I, I, there's, there's a yeah. shift going on. Um, I haven't checked. Is this, you know, you're supposed to ask questions you know the answer to. Uh, the museum website would probably have a pretty good lineup of uh, the coming events. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah, I would highly recommend visiting the museum and also checking out the online archives of the museum because over the past number of years we've been digitizing a lot of the collection, uh, especially oh. the photo collections. It's amazing. So yeah. uh, that, that's another whole resource. It's a yeah. kind of a virtual uh, museum. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Now, one of the running uh, things, uh, this lecture series with Andrew, what, uh, I'm not sure exactly when this is going to run, but uh, I know there's at least two more. Right. What's, what, tell us about that. Okay. Well, Andrew Nick Fork is our 2014 writer in residence, the Hague Brown Writer of Residence. And again, it's a program that the community should be very proud of. Uh, it was set up about 10 years ago to honor the legacy of Roderick Hague Brown and, and his uh, early voice for stewardship and environmentalism. And uh, he would, truly was a man ahead of his time. So the, the Writer in Residence is focused around bringing uh, national writers to Campbell River to spend time in the house, and, but also to engage with the community. Um, so it's not only to work on their, on their craft, but also to you know, be part of our education or our publicity. Um, Andrew Nikafork is particularly strong in public speaking. It's part of what he does. We, we yeah. get different writers with different talents. And yeah. so when I met him and we talked about what, the, what were the kinds of public engagements he'd like to see while he's here, public speaking was definitely his thing. Yeah. So we looked at his past and the, the issues he's written about, uh, which you know revolve around media, they revolve around uh, oil in Canada, energy. Yeah and uh, liquid natural gas and fracking. Th th this is his area of research and expertise as a journalist uh, and as a writer. So we decided to do a series of talks instead of just one um, that would look at each of those issues individually. So the one we had was on media yeah. and some of the changes and pressures that media is yeah. facing. We're hoping to follow that up, by the way. Uh, I'm hoping to get Andrew on a panel here with another fellow in town. Uh, talking about new media and how it's changing the coverage of politics, and he touched on that in his uh, lecture. I thought it was excellent. Yeah, yeah, I, and I think you'll find Andrew's an excellent thinker and great speaker, and uh, yeah. very good to have a conversation with. So, yeah. so on March first, the second uh, lecture is coming up that will deal with uh, oil and energy, seeing Canada as its. Uh, evolution to a, what he calls yeah. a petro state yeah. and then on March 29th we'll look at uh, liquid natural gas LNG and fracking right. which is yeah. of course pretty topical in BC yeah. right now yeah um, and uh, the book sale let's give a plug for the museum book sale <laughs> the annual book sale <laughs> actually no good for you because it is a big fundraiser for the museum yeah, I'm trying to see uh, what yeah, it which is. dates is it now it is uh, uh, there it is uh, Saturday February 22 from 3 to 5.30? No, I don't that, think so. Oh, I, that's uh, something else. It's in March. Else. Yeah. Oh, pardon me. I think the Here book sale. Here it is, the 15th. 15th. 15th and 16th of March. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and that's a big fundraiser. It, uh, it has really grown. Um, our changing gallery is chock-a-block full of books. There are people are dropping them off now. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, I know what's on uh, Saturday the 22nd. Uh, Dan Brooks, the Conservative Party candidate, is uh, renting a room there. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, I, I did. That's like, not a public program, so no. That's, but I mean, the, <laughs> that's a rental. Yeah, but the, so anybody can rent the facility. Right. Oh, of course. Yeah. And yeah. if you've seen the facility, it's a wonderful spot. Is that the boardroom down in the basement? Depends. You can rent the boardroom. Yeah. You can rent the lobby. You can yeah. rent the changing gallery if it's yeah. available. Yeah. yeah. The theater too. Yeah. Uh, I think Elder College does their film series yeah. in the theater. Yeah. So. Good. Okay. Um, we may go back to the museum, uh, but the Arts Council. Uh, uh, that's particularly interesting to me. Uh, you've just had an annual meeting, I think. We had our AGM, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's still going well? The Arts Council has tremendously grown, and uh, that's a very interesting kind of trajectory to look at because it, it's not just our Arts Councils, it's sort of the general state of arts around the province. And mm -hmm. again, I, I started at the Arts Council very soon after the museum, actually. Uh, um, and at that time, the role of an arts council was was somewhat um, in a quandary. Where was it going to go? They were, of course, founded back in the 60s as a government program, in a sense, yeah. to encourage and foster the creation of arts 
around the province. And then government spending cuts forced them to diversify their revenue sources. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and also, Campbell River is an example of, a, of an arts council that was successful early on. I mean, its early years were very strong in the 70s and 80s and spawned an art gallery, which didn't exist before. Yeah. And then what happens is uh, an art gallery becomes strong and independent and then breaks away from the council and, because its own, and becomes its own uh, its own entity, and that happened with a number of smaller music groups and uh, theater groups, etc. Yeah. So when those groups are solid and independent and secure, what does an arts council do then? Yeah. And uh, that was part of what we had to think about. Well, what's the role of, an, of a community arts council now that those, that those uh, other organizations are strong? And this is when we started to move more and more into uh, issues like public arts and uh, the role of arts in health care, for example, and partnering with uh, John Howard Society That's and the with one. the hospice and the hospital, like, you know, yeah. looking, at, looking at ways that the arts actually integrate into communities, but not in a traditional gallery yeah. or theater sense. Are you still doing uh, troubled kids, giving them an outlet for positive energy? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. where we can, yeah. yeah. Um, we, have, we do a number of programs with John Howard. Some of, the, some yeah. of those kids are you know, kind of caught up in the criminal justice system. And, yeah. Um, yeah, we definitely, yeah. Uh, that's our focus. Yeah. Well, um, the genesis of me getting Ken on was what he's doing with the Campbellton Neighborhood Association. That's a group I'm active in. And uh, uh, it's quite remarkable. We're trying to transition a whole neighborhood. And uh, I don't know how you got involved in it, but you've made two contributions uh, that frankly were stellar. Uh, I have a photo. I don't know, Chaz, if, if it's worth showing. But uh, you were making a presentation uh, to, I guess that was one of their general meetings, and they had a class of uh, urban uh, studies students from Down Island, and they did a presentation, and it went on and on, and then you did a presentation with video, and in a way you outdid all of the students combined. Yeah, well, well thanks for that, but, <laughs> but it well, is... It, it wasn't just verbal either. It was like, you know, okay, well, what are the concepts? And you really nailed it. Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah. yeah. I, I think this is, uh, this is something that maybe is a little bit underappreciated or underutilized is the role of visual impact over textual impact. Yeah. And statistics and, you know, data and data collection are great. That's, that's yeah. good. But they should inform a next layer of, of integration into communities, and that's where visuals come in. So yeah. we, we, I say we, I work with Alex Whitcomb, a uh, local artist, uh, through the Arts Council, and together we're putting um, an agenda of looking at how the arts can be a tool and a resource for exactly what Campbellton is trying to do, yeah. and trying to kind of change its, uh, yeah. Uh, change, well, not only its look, but just kind of change the nature of the spaces that are there and the way the community access yeah. those spaces and, uh, and yeah. use the space. And, um, and yeah. Campbellton's got a fascinating history. I mean, it's yeah. got no shortage of, of uh, raw material there to draw from. There used to be a from. railway there. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a challenging environment now. I mean, yeah. the development has gone off in so many directions that, you know, yeah. is it possible to become a cohesive place again? Or does it celebrate its diversity in, in, in its yeah. uh, mixed bag of tricks yeah. there? And, yeah. and I think this is where the arts can come in and say, well, here's some ideas across a broad spectrum of approaches. Let's yeah. take a look at each of them. And then yeah. you've got uh, you've, you've got like a palette to be yeah. able to create what you want yeah. from. So that, that was our aim uh, at Campbellton. For the viewers, uh, we had Brian Shaw on. He's co-chair of the Campbellton Neighborhood Association and that group has now uh, incorporated but actually registered as a society. Uh, so they can now do some financial transactions. Uh, but uh, I, I, there's something I have here about a uh, $5,000 or $3,000 matching funds, which uh, you're trying to get the Neighborhood Association to work with. And what, if you did get the money, what would it, uh, how would it be allocated or what would you do? Well, that's up to the Neighborhood Association or what the project is. The money, the matching funds you're talking about is through an organization called ArtsVest, which is part of a larger organization called uh, Business for the Arts. 
Um, and we are part of a pilot project of looking at that larger uh, program of ArtsFest um, to be a community that has been identified as having great potential here to create business and arts groups partnerships. Uh, it, it can be for anything that's arts related within general community yeah. development. So, so these could be posters or it could be a little storefront or? It could be, uh, I mean, it, it could be whatever Campbellton identifies, for example. Yeah. I mean, if it wanted to go ahead with, uh, you know, art for bus shelters, because I hear there's a new bus shelter, right. uh, bus shelters being put there. Uh, which is huge now uh, in terms of public art. If it wanted to sort of redesign um, some of its, uh, say, crosswalks, or if it wanted to put up banners, if it wanted to work on its entranceway, because they're talking about a marquee kind of sculptural feature for when yeah. you come down off the highway, uh, any of those projects which are arts-based and are of improvement for the community will fit the criteria of the program as long as the matching funds is coming from private business. Yeah. It can't come from foundations, it can't come from government. Uh, they yeah. will match dollar for dollar for any private donations. Yeah. So it's an interesting approach to, yeah. uh, I to think, partnership uh, funding. Uh, I'm not on the executive of the Neighborhood Association, but I think I know that they're so new that they really don't have cash on hand yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so it may be next year country yeah that's right it, it's but, uh, uh, yes it's all in timing yeah now <laughs> what, this is something uh <laughs> the big rock got this new art on it well actually it didn't it's it's uh online. people thought it did <laughs> yeah. what are they doing desecrating uh, the big rock yeah what's that all about well that's a really interesting story because there's been letters to the paper and I've had my ear full of phone calls at the Arts Council over it. The, the Big Rock um, social media campaign is part of a larger project we're doing called the Cultural Mapping Project. Yeah. And it is looking at alternative or creative ways to how we uh, define, map, or look at our cultural terrain of Campbell River. One of the of the cultural icons of this community, of course, is Big Rock. And, and it, it has any number of entry points to talk about community, whether it's uh, a geological erratic or whether it, it has relationships to First Nations uh, traditions and legends and myths. Uh, it's, uh, the community has used it in a variety of ways over the year, whether it's a big pumpkin. There has been advertising in the past. It's also a high school, you know, graduation, you know, rite yeah. of passage. It, it, it's, it's really a, a canvas for community yeah. uh, endeavors. So we decided we would use Big Rock as a template for a social media campaign whereby the community can give us any image they would yeah. like to see on it and we can put it on it. Yeah. And of course we ran the article in the paper with the mapping logo on it. Yeah, that's but the Photoshop. It's thing. Photoshopped, of yes. course. It's virtual. It says right in it. <laughs> However, a number of people thought we were we had painted the big rock <laughs> and were quite outraged. And I think blasphemous was used for <laughs> for, for you know painting over people's memories. But, but as, isn't that great art? Isn't art supposed to <laughs> well, there's provoke no bad thought? publicity, they say. So but I can assure the public that we are not painting big rock and we would never <laughs> be so crass as to you know yeah. put a logo all over it. However, it did stir up a lot of passions, yeah. which is great because it shows that people care about the rock. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, uh, check it out on the website yeah. for cultural uh, mapping. Triple W Big Rock Campbell River dot com mm -hmm. and then the mapping project is triple W C R Mapping Culture dot WordPress dot com. Right. And uh, you can phone Ken and get the address. <laughs> <laughs> I had some wonderful conversations with people that were outraged that we yeah. were what we had done, and then when they realized what it was, they were yeah. very kind and yeah. apologetic, and we we yeah, okay. parted friends. So. <laughs> now, there's lots of things I could talk about here. We uh, we could do half an hour, as I said, on both. But you know, you're also personally an artist, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know how many years ago, but you did a personal performance art thing at the art gallery. Was that two years ago? Uh, well, Three, yeah, it one, could have been about two years yeah. ago, yeah. But, um, like, y you presented some very interesting ideas, and then to me it seemed like you left without 
discussing them. Mm -hmm. Was that deliberate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In that particular case, yes. Yeah, it, because it, you mean you're friendly to talk to, and then <laughs> suddenly Ken didn't want to talk. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, what's going on with that arrogant? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, no, that that was the design of. Uh, that particular artwork, performance art is, is, is something, you know, that drifts into lecture and it drifts into talk and it yeah. can drift into education. It can be part theater, you know, uh, uh, but it, it also has an edge to it that it doesn't have to follow any of those narratives or trajectories. It, it doesn't have to resolve itself like yeah. theater has. It doesn't have to be educational. It doesn't have to be cooperative if it doesn't yeah. want to be. And in that particular one, it was, uh, I think you're thinking of the what everything performance. It was designed to be much like Nikephoric talked at the museum, this absolute distraction of information that plays itself as news and plays itself as media, but in fact has no content to it. Yeah. And it really is just all kind of fluff. Yeah. Um, and what everything was somewhat of an attempt to, to yeah. be that confusing mosaic yeah. and bombardment of really not that interesting or, or, yeah. or trivial things that in the end are kind of a metaphor for what we're bombarded yeah. with every day with no explanation, no apologies, uh, no, because nobody yeah. apologizes to me yeah. for the, the junk that they throw yeah. at me every day, you know, so. Uh, recently, uh, I was watching the Beatles uh, on TV and they had Yoko Ono in the front row dancing. And then on the Grammys a couple of weeks ago, she was again there in the front row dancing. Mm -hmm. And you know, like Yoko Ono, I, I don't know if she's crazy or brilliant, but <laughs> you know, there, the, you know, just doing what she did was performance art. Yes. Well, that's her background. Yeah. I mean, this is uh, Yoko Ono was an artist and a performance artist before she met uh, John Lennon yeah. and uh, and continued to be an artist even through their relationship and, and after John's. Uh, after John's death, so you know she she is legitimately uh, and I was part of the Fluxus movement in the early yeah. '60s and and had a career of her own. So you know she she gets an awful lot of uh, flack from I think her influence on on Lennon and yeah. the Beatles, but uh, but she was an unapologetic artist before though before that. So yeah, yeah. she she yeah. she can actually. Uh, now, how about your own time. art? Uh, uh, apart from doing that performance thing, uh, you paint mm -hmm. and you sculpt, I think? Yes. Well, my yeah. background is, is as a sculptor, um, yeah. uh, but they drifted into multimedias, which is what they call you know, sculpture in an expanded field. It moves into installation art, it moves into video and sound art, and then it moves into yeah. public art, yeah. and then it drifts into you know, temporary public art, which drifts into performance-based or theater-based arts. I mean, they all interconnect. Yeah. So but along the way... How are you with finding time to do your own art? Well, I, I probably speak for all arts administrators everywhere that are artists. It's tough. Yeah. And uh, the demands of, of jobs now, especially not-for-profits, are huge just on funding alone. And the time to be an individual artist is always a challenge. Uh, you really sometimes just like the what everything ending you just have to be firm and say I'm not dealing with that this is my weekend or this is my time and you just yeah. get pr protective of that you know so. yeah. but it, it is uh, it's a challenge but uh, I yeah. think a lot of people are challenged with a lot of things in yeah. the current economy <laughs> so artists aren't alone <laughs> you yeah. know, I think how do you juggle the two full-time jobs they've synced up actually fairly well there's a lot of overlap between you know programming at the museum and uh, yeah. what an arts council does. So I, I have to say both the organizations uh, have, have come to understand that it's a very good link up yeah. and so they, they're intermeshed now and, and yeah. I find my day has connections in both uh, depending who I'm talking yeah. to. I mean, and for so example... So neither one clock watches on you then? No. Thank, yeah. Well, thank God, because yeah. it would be impossible to kind of tease them apart because yeah. if I go talk with Andrew, for example, you know, Andrew's a writer, uh, yet he's the Haig Brown writer in residence. I mean, there's two, there's actually not two discussions there, but if we were to look at uh, what they are in terms of art, well, we can talk about writing and his style of writing and, and uh, the types yeah. of things he does on blogging or like with the tie as compared yeah. to novels or, or books, or as I should say, his yeah. books he writes. But then there's his public speaking skills and then there's his research skills, then there's historic content for things. So 
at a certain point they are one discussion even yeah. though they may have applications yeah. that would be appropriate for a museum yeah. and then applications that would be appropriate for the Arts Council, which is true of, of almost every yeah. artist I meet. So, um, I, I know writers and residents in the past have had some coaching sessions. Uh, mm -hmm. Is Andrew going to be doing any he, coaching? He, yep, yeah, there is a couple of days he's available that have been put on the website. Um, yeah, the one-on-ones yeah. with writers. That, that's always a part of it. Again, I think it's the skill of whoever the, the author is or the writer that's in town. Andrew's uh, medium is much more public speaking, so there's more of a fo focus on that than the one-on-ones. We've had past writers, though, that uh, absolutely love the one-on-ones and yeah. don't really like speaking in public that much, so yeah. we just shift the residency to yeah. focus more on that. The residency can be flexible to accommodate yeah the skills of the writers. Uh, two things, we got about three minutes. Uh, the Sybil Andrews Cottage uh, as a facility, that's the Arts Council's main hangout now. Uh, and uh, I guess the Arts Gallery is separate totally now? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, Eric now, Gallery's downtown. Is, are there any issues with Sybil Andrews Cottage or is it, I think there was a renewal that's recently? Sybil Andrews Cottage is an absolute success story and congratulations to the city. That cottage was scheduled for demolition around 07 when the Frank James Park expansion was going to go on. And because of the Heritage Society that formed and the Arts Council, uh, we fought back because the stature of Sybil Andrews was and still is not really well understood in Campbell River. Uh, yeah. this, this woman is a major international figure in, in English futurism and, and European avant-garde in the 20s and 30s. Mm. That how she would come to Campbell River is this, uh, a remarkable story. So uh, historic places are not always about the buildings. They can be about the people who are in them. And right. of course, Sibyl Adams Cottage is an example of that. It's really just a, an old logging camp. But it seems camp to work pretty well. It's fantastic. Uh, the city decided not to demolish it and, and actually invest in it as a heritage property, which they did with a new foundation, new roof, and that uh, now it is almost totally booked all year round yeah. as a community gathering place. It's not a museum. It's actually a space for people for yeah. culture and arts groups to come together and meet yeah. at very low cost. So. Uh, last question. Uh, the transformations on the shoreline, the driftwood carving, mm -hmm. uh, chainsaws, I think it's a great event. But is that art? <laughs> it, like, you know, they're doing it for prizes. Yeah. Of course it is. You know, yeah. I mean, it's uh, some of the things that are created are fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And I think that they offer an entry point for people who are amateurs and, you know, novices, like, uh, right up to professionals. and same. So they have a number of categories. Um, the yeah. debate of what is or isn't art is sometimes a bit of a black hole to go into. You know, uh, there's, there's a lot right. of angles to the discussion, yeah. but of course it's art. Yeah. It's a great community event. Okay. And We've uh, got to cut it there. Yeah. <laughs> but no, that's a good no. ending. Uh, thank you, Ken. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for watching. Thank you, volunteers. Thank you, Chaz Producing. Uh, talk about on Shaw is uh, a good institution, and uh, tell your friends about it, too. Thank you.